Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. I'm your host, Chris Brown, and we are continuing our year long series on municipally elected leaders from across this great country. We are sitting down with elected leaders to talk about themselves, their community, and of course, the all important question duty to serve. Today, we're heading to my home province of Alberta, and we're going a little bit north this time to the town of Manning, and we're sitting down with the mayor of the town, Robert McLeod. Mayor McLeod, Robert, welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. Thanks, Chris. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the opportunity. So, Mayor, I, uh, Robert, I want to start with this question for you, and it's a question that I've asked every single person on this show, so you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve come from? Well, I guess uh, fundamentally, I'm a, I'm a, my background is, is high school teaching. So, so I, I've been in the education business for, for uh, 38 years, maybe getting on 39 this year. And um, the, the, the duty to serve kind of comes from the fact that we teach citizenship, right? And so when you teach citizenship, the, the ultimate goal i suppose would be would be politically or or i guess you could go the religious side but let's say if you stay to the political side you know that uh serving your community as an elected leader is probably the the, the highest level of citizenship you can attain and, and when i would have taught that to my kids or to my students over the years and so the opportunity arose after i retired uh to, to become way more active in, in in politics so uh so that's what i did i uh i you know, we, we had a we had a little bit of an issue that that kind of forced me out of retirement with the town, but I don't know if that'll come up now or that may come up later. But, uh, but so, that's uh, where we're fundamentally that that teaching citizenship really. So I want to talk about your entrance into politics because you come to politics late in life. Most people would get involved earlier on, but you waited until after retirement. But I want to go back to you as a child. Was politics ever in the cards for Robert or was it something that was something that was never even discussed at the dinner table? Or was it something that was and it was just I would be volunteering, I'd get involved, volunteer, but I would never put my name on the ballot. Right. Well, you know, uh, um, my my dad specifically was uh, was. um, I guess you call them closet politicians, where where the, the family dinner table always politics was on the table, and uh, but he was as equally involved in the religious aspect. So so either I was going to be a preacher or a politician or a teacher because they all seemed to have the same basic skills, you know, you know, wanting to talk in public, uh, you know, control things around them and things like that. So I, I did have a little brief stint in in the religious world, but but I. I I, I didn't uh, follow it through and I, I went into teaching instead and it, it gave me the same kind of opportunities to, you know, to get in front of, it was kids. They, they're way less critics than adults, but uh, yeah, no, it was, it definitely was something I was uh, uh, kind of born into, so to speak, but, but none of my relatives actually went into politics. I'm the first one that actually achieved any kind of a chair of any kind, like, so the mayor's chair. Um, my, my, my thrust though, my reason I left, <laughs> I, I came out of retirement, I suppose is how, how you'd say it. The reason I came out of retirement was, as you're aware, you know, the, the northern towns, the northern municipalities are struggling big time. Uh, uh, we're, we have a continually, slowly declining population. Uh, you know, it, it, if, if oil and gas is good, well, then, then we're doing better. But still, each time that it goes down... People no longer come up here to live. They just, you know, come from Grand Prairie or they come from Edmondson or, or they fly in or whatever. So, so in, in trying to save or not save this little town, but we just about were ready to be uh, absorbed into the county. Uh, we we went through a, a process called uh, uh, I wrote it down, the by a viability review, in which the town, at the, the current councilors at the time, the mayor at the time, didn't feel that we maybe could survive anymore as a corporate entity. At, at which when I heard that, I said, wait a minute, that is not going to happen while I'm still in this town. So I, uh, I, uh, I decided to, to get involved in politics and, and go to the meetings. And we, you know, we were able to, to maintain our corporate identity. And we, we are independent still. And we're, we're doing much better. We, we have a balanced budget and, and a little bit of surplus for the last couple of years, since, since, uh, for sure, since I've been mayor and when I was a councillor for a year. 
So I want so, to go so that back. Me into Paul. I want I want to jump into that 2021 election here because you you this was your very first time running in an election, and um. I, I can imagine that you are a community community oriented person. You were the former principal of the high school. You had the pulse of what your community's needs and wants are. But in 2021, are you saying the main reason you got involved and you wanted to run locally was because of that viability report that was presented that said, okay, the town of Manning is no longer going to be here. And correct me if I'm wrong, it's the county of Northern Lights that you're surrounded by or the county of uh, what? Actually, you're correct. It's, it's the county of Northern Lights, and we're kind of the, the mother the mother town in it. We're the largest town. We're, the, we're actually the only incorporated town in in, uh, in the county. Uh, so, yeah, it, it, you know, we've been around for, I think, 19, uh, I think it was 51, and, you know, as, it, as we grew. But, yeah, the, the, we, we have been paying taxes and putting up arenas and pools and different things, you know, and it was just, it's a shame that at a stroke of a pen, we would have, lost that entire value of our corporate entity and, and it would have transferred to the to the county of which which I don't any issues with the county. I love the county. They're the same there are there are brothers, cousins, you know, people on council have property in the county. I mean, so it was that idea, but we 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 I really thought it was important to maintain our corporate identity and to maintain our asset values. And, and so that's yeah, I, I was kind of forced into it. I didn't, I so was that was, social, was that last thought, election social, was that last election fought on that issue? Was that the major issue that you heard at the doors or were there more micro issues that you were hearing like potholes need to be fixed, healthcare needs to be addressed, or was it more of that viability of the town going forward? It's the decision you have to make. You either go for the merger, the incorporation of the town, or you go with the proposed of we're going to be part of the uh, County of Northern Lights now. Yeah, no, it, it was, it's that idea that, that the town doesn't want to lose its identity, its, its, its voice, its, its uh, power to make decisions at the local level, where as soon as you get into the county, the county has a lot of hamlets and villages that it has to take care of. And, uh, you know, we would be just become another one in, in line, whereas right now we're, we, we run our own public works department. We, I mean, we're, we're, we're an entity on our own. I'm not sure that answered your question. Uh, no, but did that it, answer your question? It, it did, but it didn't because it, the the big question is was oh yeah, was right. there other micro issues involved in that campaign, or were there more macro issues, as in just the yeah. one major issue of incorporation or not to not to to merge or not to merge? Well, the, the good news is, I guess we we had solved that issue through a through a, a vote, a town vote before the election. Okay. So, so we were viable going into that election, and and uh, I continued on in it simply because the reason that the town was so far, you know, the reason the town even considered a, a viability review was was because we were so far in the hole. We were in terms of budgeting and things like that, and and I wanted to get on council with the idea that I needed to go more right wing with council's decisions than left wing. And because our, our councillors very rarely get elected, I mean, most are acclaimed. I, I was lucky enough to actually, I went, I, I challenged a past mayor for the, for the chair and I, I was successful in winning it. And, you know, one of the things I was always concerned about was that we, we tend to be big, big, big government. And uh, we, need, we needed to look at other ways of, of, of you know, saving money and, and making decisions that, that, that keep us viable. And, and, and it turned out really well, uh, you know, uh, my, my, <laughs> My political opponent is still in the wings, waiting to maybe maybe come back at me in, in, in four years or about three years now. But uh, yeah, it's it's kind of fun. It's we so, know everybody. I, will, I want to talk about friends. election it's night. I want to talk. About, oh, sorry. I want to talk about the election night. I know there's some audio issues going on right now, so I do apologize for that. Um, but I want to talk about election night in particular. Because the moment it's announced that you are now the mayor elect for the town of Manning. What weight and responsibility do you put on your shoulders to make sure that the decisions you make are the going to benefit the town, 
but also benefit the majority of the people. Because you know and I know that you're never going to please 100% of the people 100% of the time. So you're going to have to ruffle some feathers. But how much of a responsibility do you put on yourself to make sure you're educated going into those meetings, you're informed about what the issues are, and informed about what your citizens are looking for as well? Actually, it was a, it was a huge issue. Uh, as you know, COVID was in the middle. It, it, this whole thing occurred. My whole, my whole entrance into politics occurred just as COVID showed up in, in, in March of 2020. So it, it was a very strange introduction uh, to politics. But yes, once you, you get elected, then you say, yeah, you know, okay, no more talking about it. It's time for doing. And, and it's, it's time to try to, to work absolutely for the benefit of the majority of people in town. And, 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 you know, that's, that's the focus. So everything we do, every motion that's made, it, it's kind of with that idea that, you know, we, we, we have to try, you're right, you're not going to please everybody, but if you can please as many as you can, then that, then that's the objective. And so any, anything that came up since then, that's, that's what we focused on is, yeah, everything should be for the benefit of the town and, and its people. So how do you balance that? How do you balance the needs of the many against the needs of the few? Because your town is just like the town that I used to live in, in Northern Alberta, Slave Lake and Faust, Alberta, Big Lakes County. Oh. And I can tell you that the vocal minority, and I say that with respect to them because their issues are important to them. Um, they will be the ones who will yell, scream and talk about the issues. But the the silent majority will say, okay, do what you need to do. Just don't raise my taxes too high. Don't destroy my pocketbook because I want to live and I want to save for the future. And if you have to make a service change, make sure you're doing it in the best of all the world. So how do you balance that as a small town mayor? Because I think there's a lot of people out there right now who are going, why get into municipal politics if you're not going to try to move your city forward, but also at the same time, not hurt people financially? Exactly. Uh, one thing I learned in the in the education world uh, was that uh, people need to express themselves, so you, they have to have voice, and and more than that, you have to listen to it. And it doesn't matter whether we agree or disagree at the point at that point in time. It's, it's you have to give them that opportunity to express whatever it is they need to express. You know, so that so that you they know that their voice has been heard. Then, then after that, you, you, you can try to sway them with, with, with reason and, and, and different methods of argument. And, and in a town this size, it actually sounds like that would be difficult, but it, it's not that difficult. We, it's funny, we, we, we all, you know, right now with the left and the right splitting wide open, right, where, where your extremisms on both sides, it's, it doesn't help. But really, it's like the only place that that doesn't rear its head yet has been in, in, in town. It's like... We're still functioning in the old, old ways before Trumpism showed up and, and, and this divergence of extremism uh, has showed up. So I have been very lucky and, I, and I've, I haven't had a lot of issues like that. So, you know, I, basically we like to give everybody voice. Our, our, our council is made up of a very diverse group of people. And so it's really well expressed when we, we go through our discussion period. And when we come to voting, you know, we, we very rarely don't have a unanimous vote. So so that's that's how I balance. It's just it's like. Everything is important, but eventually we do have to reach a decision, and, and it has to always be for the best of for the best of the community, and that's the larger community, right? So when I say community now, I'm speaking of Northern Lights, the people that come to our schools, the people that come to our churches, the ones that use our hospitals. Those those are the outlying people. They are our community, and that's fundamentally what we, we really want to uh, address in terms of meeting their, their needs. Do you, does the town of Manning have a MOU with the County of Northern Lights around community services? Like if someone from the town or the county comes and use your pool or uses your soccer fields, does the town and the uh, county work hand in hand together to split some of that? Like it may not be 50, 50, it may be 70, 80, 70, 30 or 80, 20, but how often are you working with your county partners in their reeves and their counselors to ensure like you said it's not just the town you have to worry about but it's the surrounding area as well exactly that's a good question we have what is called an intermunicipal uh, <laughs> intermunicipal inter agreement framework agreement <laughs> yeah yeah that's what it is <laughs> and um 
it, it's, it, it was only implemented like three years ago, like when everything was happening. Uh, and since then, uh, the county has been great. Uh, they, they are our partners in, in, in everything that the community, just about it. I shouldn't say everything. There's a few areas we still have to address, but fundamentally, the arena, the pool, all of the things that we do as a community and the community benefits from, we, uh, we, we, that we all benefit from. Uh, oh, I lost my train of thought there. Was, where well, was I going with that? Uh, you, were, you were talking about the intermunicipal <laughs> agreement. We're going to cut that part out so that way it doesn't look like you've lost your train yeah. of thought. So to start back up, I'll, I'll ask the question again. Yeah. How, how, how often are you working with your county uh, relatives, in some sense your partners, uh, to ensure that how you budget is not completely on the backs of your residents because you have to also realize that the county residents also use some of your amenities like your pools and your soccer fields. So is there an agreement like the intermunicipal agreement that you work hand in hand so that way not all the money falls on to the, the, uh, the residents and the taxpayers of the town of Manning? Exactly. And that was, first of all, you're, you're, you're correct. We, we have what is called the inner municipal uh, agreement framework the framework agreements and it's uh it it, for, it it's a probably something that came from the province that kind of demands that those you know that the communities within the counties work together for for the common good of everybody and, and they kind of put it as a mandate so it it did give us a lot, lots of opportunity it took that, that's one of the reasons why our budget is is at least being balanced uh, and, and with a little bit of a surplus, simply because the county has stepped up. They realize that they do need to, to carry their share. You know, there are other things like, you know, for example, when you when you have a church in town, it doesn't pay any taxes. And that's fine. That, that That's that's a religious rule. But but that, yet they still use our services. They still use our roads that have to be cleaned and they use our water and our sewer. And and so, you know, you would think that that there would be even bigger contributions to to really sharing the, the costs, but you know the, that one's a little tougher. But we but we definitely work together, and we work. Uh, and it's been really good, and and I'm really looking forward to the next couple of years too as we work. Uh, you know, we're replacing the the ice plant in our in our uh, arena, and uh, they're right on board. They're going to pay. Well, first of all, the government, the, the provincial government, they fund us, right? So so. Every dollar we we spend, some of it, you know, sixty percent comes from the government, and so now if the county's helping out, we're paying twenty percent. They pay twenty percent. So uh, yeah, we're we're able to. We're really we're we're moving along in a good direction. We feel like we're 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 we're, we're in good shape. If we can just bring back, if we just can bring back the people, like we have more jobs available in the town of Manning. Abuse against municipal officials, elected and staff members has risen dramatically over the past handful of years. And to date, everyone has been dealing with these issues on their own and often on a case by case basis. While we can't eliminate all abuse of officials, we can take steps to mitigate the impact of those instances. On April 27th and April 28th, Strategic Steps Incorporated is hosting a symposium in Edmonton, Alberta, focused on bucking the trend. Attendees will come away with the understanding of fostering a safe space for both administration and council. Learn from industry leaders on how to deal with unsafe and abusive behavior, how to build a supportive team that provides support, and you can walk away with the tools and resources to help avoid abuse in local government. Get your tickets today at buckingthetrend.ca. Uh, Mayor McLeod, I want to jump into my last question before we move into segment two. And my last question to you, if you can hear me, is the, the town of Manning is a small community. You are the mayor. You are the frontline politician that people deal with on a regular basis. Their MP will go to Ottawa. Their MLA will go to Edmonton. But you're there 24-7. Have you found the work-life balance of being a small-town mayor uh, challenging? Because I can imagine you don't want to be Mayor McLeod 24-7 if you go to your grocery store, if you go to the, the ice rink, or if you go to the local bar. I can imagine there's days you just want to be Robert. Have you found that work-life balance? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question too. Uh, um, because I'm in a little town and, and I've lived in this town for 38 years, it, there's a, a familiar a familiarity that that uh, exists. Now, 
the work life balance is is really good. I, I got to be honest with you. Uh, I'm I'm a retired person, and so I do have <laughs> lots and lots of time. But we are a very small town, and so the demands, like when you listen, when I listen to the, the, the mayors and the work that they have to do in the cities of Grand Prairie, and Edmonton, and Calgary, these big places, I think, wow, we don't even address any of those issues. So the work, the, my mine is good. My work life balance is is real is good. Uh, it fits really well in as a retired person. And when but I was I, a teacher, can I am I, I'm just going to interrupt you because I can imagine going to the grocery store is not what it used to be compared to being a teacher, right? Because the average person would might stop you and say, "Hey, my water bill I got to me and it's fifty dollars higher than it was last month, and we use less water." So those questions yeah. will come up at the grocery stores, or why is my tax bill a hundred dollars more when you said the taxes are zero percent because mill rates and all that have to be taken into custom, but also the education tax. So. I can imagine while you, you're you going to say it's probably easier for you, there's days that you just want to be Robert, isn't there? Absolutely. No, absolutely. Uh, I was saying there that, so <laughs> this is hard to believe, but in a little town, teachers have that kind of celebrity status. Uh, and, and, and like I was saying, I, I've taught here for so many years that when I was teaching, you went to the, the movie theater. Oh, they all looked and turned and, and said hello as you walked in and, and in the grocery stores, at the everywhere. It just was part of who you were because you were so involved in the community. So the transition from being a teacher to being a mayor was actually quite easy. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and you know what? I, I just have been very lucky. They, I have not had my phone run, run off the hook. I don't have people knocking on my doors complaining about stuff. And I'm I think it has to do with the quality of the office people we have. They always feel the first questions. And, and if they, they if it's properly fleshed out, that's as far as it ever gets. It's very rare so far, I, and I fingers crossed, uh, that, that I get uh, complaints directly to me. As a matter of fact, I can honestly say I don't think I may have had three phone calls in the last two years where, where – an issue was so big that someone phoned me. But other than that, you know, it's, it, I got to say, it, it's, I have no, no complaints in that area. Is politics what you thought it was going to be when you first uh, put your name forward to go into elected office? Um, I would have to say it's certainly not exactly the same, but but I did have a fairly good idea of it. Uh, how it how our, our local newspaper always covered the, the the goings on that happened in council over the years. So so as a small town, you you do it's easy to keep up with it. So it wasn't too surprising. Um, no, I would have to say, no, no, it, it, it's, it's kind of what I thought. And, and it's, oh. that's probably why it's out as well as it does. So I want to turn to segment two now. And in segment two, I want to preface this question because we seem to always get emails from your, the citizens who you, you represent uh, or the people who I've had on represent. This is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a decision of council. This is not a motion of council. This is the mayor's opinion. So. With that being said, Robert, in your opinion, what is the biggest issue today, as of recording, facing the town of Manning? <laughs> oh, you're not going to believe it. Uh, believe it or not, well, the, the biggest issue, okay, so we, we the, here's, okay, as of this recording, the biggest issue was, what are we going to do with our high school? That has uh, we have two separate schools in, or two different public schools in town. One is uh, the Manning Elementary School, the other is the Paul Rao High School. Both those buildings are going to be uh, demolished, and the province is building a, a brand new K to twelve school here. So we're very happy about that. But when we look at the, the, the Manning element, the old the, the elementary school it needs to be demolished. It's it, you know except for the gym could be used, but the Paul Rao High School, on the other hand, is a big, 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 massive building, beautiful gym, and, and uh, the school division, Peace River School Division Number 10, has, you know, kept it to its absolute perfect condition. However, it, it was built in the years where asbestos was around, and it has a kind of a liability with it, which nobody wants to touch, you know, and we tried to, and I, 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 we tried to, uh, purchase it, the, the school division is willing to let it go for very cheap, like a dollar, but you, we then would assume control of it. But this, it's, I couldn't, I lost that, I lost that push just last week. And, and it was simply to, to use that building and the, you know, it's a $10 million building to use it for municipal 
business or, or to, to sell it or do something with it, but it, it didn't go anywhere. And so that, that's where, that was probably one of the biggest issues. It's, it weighs on everybody because they know it's, a, it's an asset to the town, but at the same time, it has a liability nature. So, so that was, was the biggest, most pressing issue that was, let's say, in my mind for over the last year when the School of Vision first announced that they were going to uh, uh, build, an, or, or, you know, give, give us a new school. Uh, it's just a shame. It, it's, a, it's such a massive building. I could, you know, so many things it could be used for, but the town has got doesn't have the money or the capital to invest in it. Uh, it was offered to everybody to come together with to come up with something, but it just it, 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 people are just saying no. It's just too risky. <laughs> we might as well just level it and start from scratch. So, so that was the issue. So, what other issues are facing your town? Because I can imagine that seems like a high level ta- uh, issue. But one of the things yeah. that you mentioned earlier on in the interview. And I'm going to harken back to it because I want to know wh- how the town is handling it. Is you said, how do you bring people to your community? Your town is shrinking. Your town is people are leaving your community and people aren't coming back because when oil and gas is good, they will come back. When it's bad, then they will go away and go to other places. So how how do you sustain a community that is shrinking in size and or is it shrinking in size? And is the town looking at ways to bring people in to fill those job vacancies that you said there are currently uh, plenty of jobs available. Exactly. And, and that's, that's the million dollar question. Uh, and, and we're working on that exact issue uh, every, every week is, is what can we do to encourage it? Uh, now the, the population has reached what I would call it's, 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 it's minimum. In other words, the people who now occupy that live in the town, they're 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 older folk, right? They're more more ready for retirement. Uh, they they've been here for a long periods of time, and, and and people that do come in and the transient populations that do come in and go, they're 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 still there. So, for example, we haven't built a, a new house in this town for probably seven eight years, uh, but our our vacancy rate for our for the rental units are full. So we do have this discrepancy. It's like you know, are p- people willing to? To uh, to build and 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 raise their families here like they used to, and that's really the, our our drawing card. That's what we do is we we try to keep our arena running. Or we have kind of a sort of an indoor pool. It's actually a tented pool. Uh, we uh, we have uh, you know to try to you know, the figure skating club, the minor hockey, the old timers, curling. We we try to keep the recreational part and the beautiful the beauty aspect of the town as the drawing card that, you know, this is a great, great town to live in. It, it's nestled in the valley of the Nautikewin River. Uh, um, it's safe. It's probably one of the safest places in the whole planet in terms of earthquakes and, and, and tidal waves and all the things that can happen. And I do, I, I say, you know, if you want to build a nuclear plant, you can put it in my backyard because it's probably as safe as you could ever get. <laughs> so again, this is something that we're doing as a council. We're, we're working, what, what, what can we do to, to attract people and, and, you know, as a community, we do whatever we can. We, we, we try to create the jobs. Uh, you know, and that was one of the things that came up with, this, with the disposal of the high school is could we turn that into somehow, you know, call centers or different things that might attract people. Uh, so it's an ongoing thing and, and we haven't got the answer yet. <laughs> but uh, it, it's to diversify. Obviously, if we had other things, I mean, so we're, we're three industries in this town. We have forestry and gas sorry, forestry, oil and gas, and of course, agriculture. And it's the agriculture is the absolute base, right? When everything else comes and goes, agriculture will always be here. And that's what really sustains this town. And so it, it, the other jobs are, are fluctuate with the, with the times. And so we're, right now we're in a low time. And hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, you know, we, they talk about with this, you know, the way our federal government is trying to, trying to snuff us out with our oil and gas. And Again, that's one of those issues that I understand. You know, I understand global warming, but at the same time, you know, I can go out down a road or two here and I know where the wellheads are. I can point to a wellhead and say, that resource is coming out of my backyard and it's going to, to make the whole federal system that we have benefit from it, right? Not only the province, but, but, but the whole of Canada. So it's here, <laughs> it's getting people to stay, right? And so... Like I say, recreation, you know, the beauty of beautifying the town, uh, getting people's voices heard. That that's what I believe. That's what I believe will keep bring people here and keep people here. 
Is this an issue that's just come up over the last few years, or is this been an ongoing, like decades long issue that is now getting the attention because people are finally saying, okay, w- if if we don't do something now, our tax base is going to be hurting ten years from now because yeah. the the tax base can only go so far because you can only get blood out of a stone so or water out of a stone once until you start squeezing it dry. So is this an issue that's been going on for some time or is this just an issue that's been uh, cropped up since you've been elected mayor in 2021? No, the, the population, when I first started teaching school, there was, I think we had 26 teachers on staff. And now if you go to the school, it's, they, I think they're down to like 11. So this has been a, and that's over 30, 30 years. We've, we've had just a steady decrease in population. What's come to head though, is, is the, the federal attitudes towards not supporting the oil and gas industry. That has significantly changed over the last, over the last you know, three or four years. And certainly since I was elected. So, there is this, there is this developing, not a hatred, but it's a dislike. It's a huge dislike for the federal government right now, where we really feel that you know they're the ones that are stopping us from being as prosperous as we could be. That it's their oil and gas attitudes to to try to stifle it at our level to start with, where the whole world has to come with us. You know, why are we going to have to lead everybody in, in, in shutting the industry down? Whereas, whereas they need to look at technology to solve our issues with, with uh, global warming, not taxation. They're, they're, you know, you, they're taxing that. We're, we're, there's, a, there's, a, there's a huge issue. Taxation right now is just absolutely through the roof. And we as a, as a municipality, we, we have to look at increasing our electrical uh, fee, franchise fee, our water rate fee, all of these things, right? And, and it's, it's just stifling us. It truly is stifling us. So taxation you, you bring up a good point about the federal government because as the mayor of your community i'm assuming you've heard people come to you talk about health care issues uh, talk about oil and gas issues and while health care and education may be a provincial issue oil and gas and in the environment may be a federal issue they the, the average citizen doesn't care the average citizen looks at you and says you're the mayor do something about it so how right. much of your job has become yelling into the void of the political arena, trying to get these uh, these issues on the national and provincial stage so that way your community doesn't suffer in the long run? Because I can imagine when you get elected, you're thinking, OK, it's going to be OK. I'm going to make sure the roads are paved, the roads are cleared in the snow, the garbage is picked up, the water's there. But now I'm dealing with education issues. I'm dealing with what's what's going to happen to the school when it closes down. What's going to happen when the oil and gas sector in my community ceases because of the federal government's uh, intrusion. How much of your time is based on more provincial and federal issues than municipal issues? Um, to be absolutely honest with you, actually very little. Really? That's. Yeah, yeah, we, it's it's kind of interesting where, so we you have are, our MLA. You are a unique yeah. beast, uh, Robert, because you are the first mayor who's openly, honestly said that to me, and I can honestly believe it, because I can imagine your community seems like one of these communities that's very, you know what, we're happy the way things are, we're happy the way things are moving forward, do we want things better? Yes, but we don't want you to have to like destroy yourself to try to fix these issues that are around the world right now. Exactly. Exactly. The point, you know, and that's kind of, it's like almost like we're a microcosm, right? Where, where if you didn't listen to the news, (laughs) if you didn't, if you didn't listen to the news and knew what was going on in the world, we we would be living as close to paradise on earth as, as anywhere on this planet. And I really believe that. Uh, I mean, we have the big federal issues and and we have the big provincial issues for sure. I mean, uh, we have a we have a we have the same health problems, or sorry, the same health issue problems that everybody else has had. We have an ambulance issue. We had a massive freaking issue happen, uh, you know, where where a fella went down in at the curling rink, and we had to we had to bring a an ambulance from almost sorry from Peace River to come and get him to move him a minute and a half to the. Because he 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 needed a back stretcher to 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 our hospital, 
can you believe that? It was, the hospital's a minute and a half away, and we had to bring in an ambulance from Peace River to move him. And then by that time, they said, no, we got to get him going. So the fire department put him on a stretcher, and we had to put him in the back of a, of a SUV and bring him up to the hospital. The next day, they had to bring an ambulance from Grand Prairie to bring him to come to Manning to bring him to Peace River for a, for a, for a CRT scan. And then they went back and then they left him in, and they left the poor guy in Peace River forever. So, so we have issues, you know, you know, but, but like, honest to God, it's like neighbors, neighbors support neighbors. And, and we have this attitude that, you know, things go on in the world, but, but fundamentally we, we keep our house in order and, 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 and functioning and working to the best that we can, you know, the world can deal with the big problems and, and we'll deal with the little problems. And, and that's kind of, kind of my philosophy. So let's talk about those small problems, because if I go talk to your community today, and I, I, I've i been to the town of Manning, I, I know it quite well. I've had the pleasure of driving through it a few times, going up north to high level when I lived in uh, Big Lakes County. And I can say yeah. I, I've stopped at, at the big giant moose that's outside, which we'll talk about tourism in a few minutes. But um, if I go talk to 100 people in your community today, they'll give me 100 different issues that they believe are the most important thing to them. That pothole in front of John's house needs to be filled because it's wrecking my car that sidewalk that i walk on every day to get exercise needs to be fixed that park in my area needs to be updated because my kids use it on a regular basis how do you collect as mayor and council all those different issues that people are facing and then look at the budget which is very hard right now for a lot of communities and say okay John's issue is important. Becky's issue is important about that park. Uh, that sidewalk in front of Steve's house needs to be updated. But we only can pick two out of those three issues because we don't have the money to do all the things that people want. How do you balance the needs of your community when it comes to individual issues, when it comes to a budget cycle where people are struggling right now and you don't want to improve your city, uh, community on the backs of people who are suffering the most? One of the things that the provincial government uh, demanded of, of our town, if we were to remain solvent, was to come up with a 10-year municipal plan uh, to address infrastructure problems and potholes and, and all of all of those issues. So I, we have an amazing CAO who, who's right on top of the, on top of the game, and so it, it's all on a it's all on a plan. It, it's we have everything kind of scheduled up for the next ten years in terms of things that have to be done, things that need to be done and, and urgent need to be done immediately. So in a municipality, that's that's how it works. We, they, it, it works fairly at a slow slow, slow pace, but an intentional slow pace, where where we, we're planning down the road to to you know whatever it has to be done. Uh, it gets on the books. Uh, you know, even if it's a new. Uh, you know, new um, fire truck. I mean, a fire truck is very expensive, so <laughs> we've been asked for it, and so we're putting money aside. So our so our bank account is healthy in that we are addressing these issues, and and to me that's that's the answer is is it's just to have the plan in place. If you have a plan in place, then you can you can say to your constituents or, or to your, your your members of your community that you know, okay, so your road will get new pavement in in two thousand and six, and. Uh, your water and sewer will be replaced in, you know, 2012 or whatever. So, so that you show that that things are not just going randomly. We, you know, we have a plan. Uh, we're working the plan, and now it's just a question of of dealing with those immediate issues and those that need to be done, and the, those that could could wait a little bit. So, uh, do you do, do not, the people of your community uh, understand that that? we have a plan, we stick to the plan. Yes, if there's major incidents that come up, water line breaks, uh, complete destruction of a road because of out, out, uh, outside per, uh, issues, do, do the people understand that, you know what, we do have this plan, we have to work to this plan, but if there's issues that come up, we can fix them. But right now we're focusing on this 10-year plan because the provincial yeah. government has told us to do it. Yeah, I believe they do. And one of the things that I did when we first got on, uh, when I first got on council, and, and it was part of the viability review as well, was to to ha was to increase the because we had for a number of reasons. I, I got to make sure I talk slow enough here. <laughs> for a number of reasons, is we looked at. Um, oh, where am I on this? <laughs> 
I shouldn't. When I interrupt myself, I lose my train of thought. <laughs> uh, just, 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 just the very end of it again. Uh, the end of my question again. Yeah, just as the end of it again. So, how how do you balance that the 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 idea that people want it now, but you have to tell them we're sticking to this plan? Do they do they do they understand the fact that you have a plan, but if issues come up, the town is able to address them? But the big expenditures that people want, like a big new pool, a new rec facility may not be in the best interest of the community because we have to try to make ourselves soluble, soluble right now. Okay. So, so what I was, where I was going was that when I first got on council and part of the viability study was to make ourselves available and transparent. And so I suggested to council in my, I think my second, second meeting or third meeting was why don't we put a camera up in the corner and we'll broadcast on Facebook live all of our meetings so that so that anybody that wants to listen to it or review it uh, can do that and and I think that has made a people I think underestimate the impact that that have has because it really opens up the whole meeting and, and everything uh, very transparent so that so that in the discussions that occur in council, now people can actually listen to them, and so they follow along with the with the reasoning and the argumentations that happen, and so they're they're, they're they they've witnessed it, and so they realize that when it, you know when it comes to actually voting on the motion, that's what we had to do, right? So it, it takes it's I believe it's communication. The, the better we communicate with our people in this town and the community around us, the less difficulties that we will have. I mean, we still have the problems, but. You don't have that that silent voice or someone's voice that that never is heard, and they don't they don't get it. Where where now they can listen to what's going on. They listen to our proceedings. They listen to when the topic came up and the arguments for or against, and then the final decision. So that that's that's how, how I that's how I would say is the reason why it seems that this job is as as good as it is, or as as reasonable and balanced as it is, is because I think that's what it was. Now, there's a pressure to stop that. <laughs> so the counselors don't really want to be on, on television like that, and I can understand it. But I really think that transparent opened up the transparency transparency issue so that if they just, if they're interested, they can listen and they can go back and listen if they wanted to. Yeah. Anyway, that, that, I think that's, that's where I'm that answers that. my question exactly what the way I want. That communication is always key, but I'm cautious of time here. And I want to turn to my very last uh, segment and that is tourism. I like tourism Ooh. because I like to visit communities. Uh, we always talk about the staples of tourism, whether it be Jasper or Banff or Drumheller, but we always have to remember there are small communities that, that are hidden gems and we need to discover them. So mayor McLeod, as a tourist, who uh, I am one, that is going to be coming through your community later this summer. Yes, that's right. I'm making a trip all the way up to the town of Manning to visit your community again. What are some of the hidden gems to see? What are some of the hidden gems that people should be watching or looking out for or exploring while in the town of Manning? Okay, very good question. Uh, uh I should start off by saying that when I first got into politics and on council, again, it was I was really thinking tourism is, is really exciting and interesting. But when I joined uh, Mighty Peace Tourism Association, or where the town was belonged to, them, we we uh, I looked around and said, "Oh wow, this is quite a this is way more of a county issue." Most of our most of our tourist attractions are in the county. We, we have a, a beautiful bread and breakfast in town. We have a swimming pool. We have a arena, a curling rink, those type of amenities. But as for zip lines, or um, yeah, I mean, we have the beauty of the of the Nauticaan River flows through the town. But but as for an actual tour sites, they all, all of the the gems are outside of the out of the town, so they're in the county. Uh, we and you have to like hunting. Like our major tourist uh, thing up here is hunting. So and in, and as you can imagine in the internet right now. Uh, and you can, you, if you take a picture of you and your animal, you down, you could get in trouble. <laughs> but that is that's part of our lives up up here. We we hunt, uh, you know, the geese and, and the ducks in the in the in the fall. But uh, right now it's wolf season, and uh, you know we we their wolves are being bagged. <laughs> you know, uh, and if you like that type of thing, well, this is the place to come. Big game, the moose, the deer. Uh, I had a I had a, a mountain lion, honest to God, mountain lion walk through my yard. That's the first time I've ever seen one, and uh, never seen one since. But uh, that's the type of, of, of things here. Now, 
we don't have the business tourism that I, I would like, you know, I would like to see where we have, uh, you know, a museum that, well, no, sorry, we have a museum. Uh, it's a pioneer museum uh, that kind of just stores the, uh, the materials and, and items and artifacts from years past. But if we had a museum that showed our animals, you know, stuffed animals or, or, or petting zoo or things like that, that would be, that would be right on. However, the physical size of the town situated in the County of Northern Lights really puts the onus for tourism on, on the county people. So there's, you know, Whispering Winds, Winds Ranch, which is a place to, you can, like the Nauticuan flows into the Big Peace River, right? And so that whole area is, you know, we have the Nauticuan Park, Provincial Park. Now it's currently shut down. Um, I know my, the, the local people really want to see it back open, open back up, but they had shut it down last year. And I, I don't know where they are with that one, but, but beautiful Provincial Park. Uh, wildlife like you wouldn't believe um, but as for specific tourist attractions that's what this community is lacking and that's what this county is lacking i i have to is- i have to interject though because i i'm sorry but you, every time i've driven through your town i always have to stop and take a selfie with the big giant moose <laughs> <laughs> the moose <laughs> the moose <laughs> That's, I don't that's, know. That's I don't funny. know if it's named Manny the Moose or what, but uh, every time yeah. I've driven through the town of Manning, I've stopped and taken a photo with that moose. I'm pretty sure I have about a hundred photos with that moose after all the driving I've done through Manning. <laughs> oh, I see. So, so you would consider that a tourist attraction? I would. I would. I yeah. think anything that's a roadside attraction that makes people stop and take a photo, I would stop. Yeah. I would do. I would consider that a tourist attraction. There you go. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. People, we actually have lights up there and stuff for people to stop and take pictures of. Uh, yeah, and that's kind of our, the land of the mighty moose is, is what it's called because, and you, you know, and it's to make sure people understand that you always got to watch out for the moose because if something's <laughs> going to take you out, it'll be a moose right on the roads. We, we, we have wildlife in the ditches all over the place. I'm sure it's not common to just uh, up northern Alberta, right? We have all kinds of wildlife and the moose is, is very dangerous. That that particular moose is funny because uh, it's it's kind of a, a municipal uh, sore spot because what? it's it's not a, it, well it, yeah because you next time you look at I want you to look at that moose and then I want you to look from its shoulders back towards the rear end of the and you'll say oh wow that's not a moose that, that's actually a horse <laughs> and, and and in fact it, it it the body of a horse with the head of a moose. So whoever they commissioned to 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 do that sculpting <laughs> didn't know what a moose looks like. So so the moose head is everybody looks at the moose head and that's for sure is a moose head. But the body is not a is not a moose. It's actually a big quarter horse or something. <laughs> Robert, you're blowing my mind right now. Every time I've gone through that, I'm like, oh, that's a moose. And now you're telling me it's not a moose. So now I have to say it's a horse's ass. Seriously, come on. Yeah, <laughs> we call it a morse. It's a morse. <laughs> A morse it, yeah. without the moose. Trying to say the moo and the horse at the same time, very hard. Um, but yeah, I, yeah. It's, <laughs> I want to ask one last question before I ask my very last question of this interview, Robert, and that is, what about yourself? After a stressful day at council, council, or after a long day at work, where do you go and decongest in your uh, community? And I have to preface this before you answer by saying you cannot say your house because every councillor and mayor I speak to always wants to say their house. So you cannot say that anymore, people. So in your community, that's not your house. Where do you go to decompress? Is there a local watering hole? Is there a restaurant? Is there a sports? Uh, is there a sports field that you go and just take a little de- detour and just sit there and relax? Well, that's a, a really good question, Chris. I, I'm beginning to think that maybe you don't know how small this town is. <laughs> oh, I know uh, how small your town is, but there's always that one spot in your town that yeah. you can go to, and you can go. You know what? I don't care how bad of my day was. Everything feels better now that I'm here. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what I did. I don't know if this is going to count or not, but I built a, a, a 32 foot geodesic uh, dome in my backyard. I have a, an acre and I put a, a, a beautiful, the biggest above ground swimming pool you can imagine in it. And I, and then I heat it. So in most times, other than in the severe parts of winter, I I, I have a, I go in and sit in that nice warm pool and all by myself or with my wife and 
It's so, there is no better way to, to relax and unwind than in the, in the comfort of nice warm water. So I, I love did. that answer, Robert. So I'm going to end this uh, interview with the question I've asked every single mayor and councillor as well. Robert, what makes the town of Manning such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Without a doubt, it's, it's the people. It, it's, it's the kindness and the sincerity and the integrity of, of the people. Uh, not only that live in town, but uh, but you know the, the ones that come to the churches and the schools, our bigger community. There's always this sense that we always look out for each other. It's like your kids are my kids. Uh, you know the, that you know we. I can send my kid to the park by themselves at four or five years old. Well, maybe not that young, but let's say five or six, knowing that that the neighbors, you know, will keep an eye. You know, they don't go out of. You know, they don't get in in your way or anything. But that your kids are safe. That that. There's a sense that uh, of belonging, a sense of family that really, you know, even though we have what five or six churches in town with different denominations, we still have a, the, the, the man, you know, and I guess it's the arena, the Manning Comets, our, our senior hockey team, kind of, you know, and the hockey itself. Hockey, we're a hockey town. We truly and truly are a hockey. We told them if they send us any more RCMP, they have to be hockey players. <laughs> they have to be able to play. <laughs> but that's what it is. We just, it's, it's just a sense of family, a large, large, interwoven family that that everyone is looking out for everybody else and and there's that sense of community that's unmatched on you know my daughter lives in the city you know, and i just can't believe it i cannot be- oh my kids live in the city actually <laughs> all my children have, either you're in grand prairie they're in yeah, they're in calgary and um it, it's i just can't believe that they don't want to live in a little town like i just i just i just can't believe it <laughs> I, I love the small town uh, living. I will be the first to admit that the the hardest decision I ever made was moving down to Calgary because I miss that small town feel. But Robert, yeah. I want to thank you so much for taking the last 50 minutes out of your day and sitting down and talking about yourself and your community. Uh, I, I can say this with all respect that your community is better off with you at the council table. So congr- thank you for putting yourself forward and serving in this role. We often forget that local politicians are the frontline politics and they're the ones that make the biggest difference in our lives. So thank you. Well, you know what? You're very welcome. And thank you very much. I, I really appreciate the fact that our Albertans are out there becoming uh, uh in the world of communication, I really wish you all the best. I, I really hope your 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 program here and your channel just explodes. Well, I think you're a, a fine you. interviewer. I like oh. that. Well, thank you. You're the first person to stroke my ego a little bit there. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're, you're welcome. <laughs> so with that, I want to remind everyone, put down social media for at least five minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our society, helps our democracy, and helps us be a better people at the end of the day. So with that, this being another interview on the cross-border interviews. Tomorrow, we are sitting down with Drumheller Mayor Heather Kohlberg, so tune in for that. Until then, talk to you later.